On Thursday, lawmakers announced they had reached a compromise on the way the Budget Committee will vote moving forward. Joining me to walk through those changes, as well as the budget picture for the legislature this year, are Representative Wendy Horman and Senator C. Scott Groh, co-chairs of the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I know you're busy. Representative Foreman, can you walk us through the compromise? Sure, following last session, there were some concerns about budgets coming to the House floor that uh, had not enjoyed majority support of the House Appropriations Committee, and it's been going on for a few years. You've, you've seen it. And so one of the ideas that came was that we could vote separately, and uh, that was an idea our clerk had supported anyway. And so uh, moving through that process, we uh, arrived at a compromise this week and are looking forward to getting to work on voting on some of the supplementals and other actions we'll need to take in coming weeks. Are you still going to vote together like you have been for the last several decades? We will be voting together. The change is that we will also announce, and that will be the vote that stands, but we will also announce the House vote and the Senate vote separately. And if a bill fails to pass either the House or the Senate side, we have agreed, we've been united through this thing, that we will refer that bill to the House where it did not receive majority support. Now, if we can keep it in committee and come to a compromise before that happens, great, it can be held at the desk or some other thing like that, but that, that is the agreement moving forward. So for Idahoans who are watching, how might so this- let me come in on that. Oh, please, okay. go ahead, <laughs> Totally supportive of this idea, and empathetic with the situation that they had. Pretty tough for them, for Wendy, for example, to go back and try to encourage the House to vote for something that her group didn't really vote for in committee. Another thing we're going to try to do is make sure that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll send it each direction, as it says, but what we really want to do is work it out in JFAC together, and we think we've got the team to make that happen. So it doesn't have to become an issue. So for folks who are watching across the state, how might this change be beneficial? Because it, it sounds like for most Idahoans that this is pretty in the weeds, but, but what, what, what are the benefits here? Well, the benefits are that uh, each house gets to say its piece and feel comfortable that when, when Co-Chair Horman carries it on the floor that she's got the full backing of her side and if I carry, carry it over on my side, I've got my group with me. So I think it's best for everybody because there's, it won't be an issue on the House floor or the Senate floor if we can take care of it in JFAC, and that's our hope. Additional benefits are that we keep the committee together. We find efficiencies by listening to all the hearings jointly rather than splitting into two separate committees. That's, that saves taxpayers money by being more efficient so we don't have to grow our staff tremendously. And, uh, you know, no other bill in any other committee advances out of the committee without majority support. And so even though we are a joint committee, we are made up of two separate committees. And so we, we hope that this facilitates uh, stronger passage of budgets on the floor. That remains to be seen though. Our teams are working really, really well together, bicameral, bipartisan. In spite of this uh, conversation around voting, the committee's working really well together. And I'll just make that comment too, that it really hasn't slowed down our work. We had about six weeks of listening to all the agency folks come in and tell us what their bills are going to be. And not until next week would we begin to vote really on on the uh, budgets for those agencies anyway. So we've, we've been able to work around it. It hasn't been a big issue. One of the things that we haven't seen yet from your committee are the supplemental appropriations, basically bills that came in after the budget was already set for the fiscal year. Uh, where are we on those supplementals? Yeah, let me help people understand. We, we're actually working on two years budgets at the same time. We have the fiscal 23 that ends in June that uh, we did a year ago, and then agencies will come and say, yeah, that was great, but we need some more money here, we need some more money there. We have 115 requests, you think about that, 115 requests to open up last year's budget that ends here in June and stick more money into it. So, so that has been uh, something we've started working through those. I work on the health and welfare side of things and, and my co-chair, uh, Wendy, works on the education side. We have 29 uh, supplemental requests just in health and welfare. So we've been working through those. We have four that have come out as being favorable that we'll start working on this next week. So we have a total of 19 actually, ready for Wednesday or Thursday next week on supplemental. So we'll start working those through. And then uh, as uh, she was saying, 
our subcommittees are doing a great job this year. We're very pleased with them. And then they will start bringing forward re recommendations on the actual budgets as well. Yeah, let's talk about this upcoming fiscal year that you're going to start budgeting for. We keep hearing it's more challenging to budget when you have more money than less. Is that proving true right now? In my eight years of experience in JFAC, absolutely proving true. Uh, uh, it's v the question is going to be for the committee with this very, very large surplus. Do we return it to the taxpayers? Do we invest it in a one-time basis? on things like parks and recreation, improving facilities that will pay dividends for generations? Or do we invest it in ongoing things that will grow government in ways that may be difficult to, to sustain in the future? As we've heard many times in, in this work, it's not the, the bad years that'll kill you, it's the good ones and setting budgets that you can't pay for in the future. We're seeing very, um, we're seeing indicators right now of a recession, certainly announced layoffs here in the Valley, uh, the Boise Valley, uh, with some major employers announcing layoffs. So those are things I think all of our committee members will be taking into account as they set the budgets. One of the things the governor is trying to do with that surplus of over a billion that we still have that we're gonna determine what happens with it, and I hope we get a bunch of property tax, because that's what I'm pushing for, relief for the homeowners. But the governor's also, he's got 300 million going for, uh, Maintenance, uh, we have a lot of deferred maintenance that hasn't taken place, so it's pretty wise really on his part to try to take care of things. You, you won't get credit for doing maintenance work, but uh, he's trying to get a lot of that done. Yeah, speaking of, it, that, that's one of the smaller budgets. One of the budgets that has gotten a lot of attention is the Medicaid budget. Um, there were a lot of questions both in your committee and the policy committees, the, the House and Senate Health and Welfare Committees about not just the $4.7 billion that you're looking at for this fiscal year, but looking forward and how that might grow. Can you give us an idea of how those talks are going? Yeah, first of all, each uh, Health and Welfare Committee on the Senate side and the House side, they were required by law to give a recommendation by the 31st of January, which they did. Both on of those- On whether expansion would stay in place. To stay in place. And so they both recommended that. Then the big question comes, now that they've recommended that, what happens with us? Because uh, as we go through all these different budgets, we'll be determining, are we really going to keep all of that there? Are we going to make some changes? And we're so new into this voting, we haven't seen any, any votes yet out of any of our people. And so it'll be interesting to see what kind of responses we get from them. Now, the, the letters from both chairmen mm -hmm. said that they wanted, they thought that Medicaid should stay in place with some caveats, with some aggressive cost reduction. On Friday, House Health and Welfare Chairman John Vanderwoude introduced a bill to repeal Medicaid expansion after his committee had initially recommended keeping it in place. Will the debate affect how your committee approaches the budget? I haven't seen that bill yet. <laughs> I just uh, saw on uh, social media this morning very briefly that that was being introduced. So I don't, I don't know what's in it, but I do know, as, as Senator Gross said, that the, it, it's on an unsustainable trajectory right now. So we've got to make some efforts around cost containment. We know that there are possibly up to 150,000 uh, folks on Medicaid in the state. Right now about 450,000 people are on Medicaid, which is almost 25% of Idaho's population. Which is amazing when you think about that. It's, it's a lot of Unreal. folks. And we do know it's doing some good. I heard some stories this week of some folks who uh, had life-saving treatments, honestly. And so really our job is, is to weigh the benefit of continuing on an unsustainable tra trajectory or trying to change that trajectory. And we met with Director Jepson this morning. I think we're, we're all very committed to doing what we need to do to uh, reduce costs. Have you been satisfied with Director Jepson's answers on what the department is doing and willing to do to reduce those costs? Uh, we have not gotten into the details of that. Uh, I have not. I'm, I'm yeah. working the education budgets. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the health and welfare. He's doing the health and welfare budget. So we haven't gotten into the details. We have an interim report that we funded last year that's come back with some preliminary recommendations. But uh, that's those are things we'll certainly be talking about here in coming weeks. It's certainly going to be an ongoing discussion, not Definitely. just this session. But. Yep. Yep. I'll just mention last year that the uh, Medicaid budget, well, the health and welfare budget as a whole, increased by about 15%. That's a lot of money when you start a base with a few billion dollars in it. 
And so I've, I've been concerned, you know, if that thing extrapolates off into future years, that's a big problem. So we've got to do something. Cost containment is the issue, as, as uh, Representative Horman said. Since you are carrying or working on the public education budget, can you give us an idea of how those discussions are going? Very fluid, I would say. There are uh, different budgets from the superintendent this year compared to the governor, and so we have uh, you know, differences in those that are more substantial than in, in years past. So that's what our work group was weighing. Uh, also, the uh, the transfer of the three hundred and thirty million dollars. Typically, my first eight years, we used to fight to get a hundred million dollars in it. Last year, we invested two hundred and sixty million. This year, we know it will be in the three hundred to four hundred million dollar range, depending on which proposals move forward. So the group is doing terrific work right now. In fact, I had to go out of an education budget group meeting this week because you can only have five members in there and not violate a quorum rule. So I stepped out of the room because so many people are interested in learning those budgets. And this is what happens when you have so many new members on a committee. They want to learn. We want them to learn. We've really tried to offer as much training as we could. And, and so very fluid but we're making progress. What policy bills are you waiting for to make some of those big education decisions? Certainly, uh, well, I'm bringing a funding formula bill that would change the way we fund, uh, working on that still. Um, I don't know that the ESA question is really delaying that. That's a question because- The education savings account. Yeah, right. yes, the school choice bill, a lot of different names for that because those are not coming from the public school budget necessarily. And so that, I don't think that's a piece of it, but um, uh, the launch bill certainly has had a lot of controversy so far, and I think there may be some new ideas around that money forthcoming. And so we have, uh, we have a preliminary schedule for budget setting, and we're, pushing the public schools budget toward the end. Got it, got it. We have uh, about half a minute left, but I wanted to ask you, do you foresee any other big or little sticking points in this year's budget discussion? Well, one of the things we've talked about is the uh, compensation issue and there's questions. For state employees. For state employees. We're looking at all of the statewide allocations across all of the budgets right now. I'm not aware of any major sticking points other than education and health and welfare. <laughs> Lucky you two. You, you two know well, we how to pick them. winners, right? <laughs> I'm sure some, right. Will, some will pop up. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Can't wait. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Senator Groh, Representative Horman, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.